Hello Theta Gang! It's Mikey Millions here, and I am very excited to welcome you to our next iteration of the Dankus Trade Series. This past autumn on November 3rd, the people of the United States went to the polls to vote for Donald Trump, or mailed in their ballot to vote for Joe Biden, thus bringing a most fiercely fought election to its climactic finish. That night, it appeared as though Cheeto and the Red Team would carry the day, and the Big Mango got up on stage to declare victory within hours of the polls closing. But the Cheese Doodle blew his shot too soon, and over the next several days, poll workers picked through their backlog of ballots. Things tightened up quickly, and all eyes turned to Nevada, where its seven electoral votes could swing the election in favor of Sleepy Joe Biden. But Nevada is 50th in education, and counting things under pressure was not her forte. Georgia and Pennsylvania actually beat her to the punch, and as Philadelphia and Atlanta tallied their votes, Uncle Joe and the donkey team emerged as the clear winners. Although Rudy Giuliani and Sidney Powell did their best to unleash the Kraken, judges were largely unconvinced that Hugo Chavez rigged the election. Even the Supreme Court and its three Trump appointees failed to put any stake in Texas's last grievance of desperation. In the final hours, a last-minute Confederate assault on the Capitol delayed but did not change the ultimate outcome, and Congress reconvened quickly to formally declare a Bidenist communist victory. All the while, investors and degenerate gamblers of all shapes and sizes tell the election and its follow-on legal drama with a magnifying glass. As a blue team victory became more and more likely, money flowed into Democrat-favored industries like electric cars, renewable energy, and dank kush, bringing sick gains for those with skin in the game. And as the broader market yeeted itself to the fucking moon of Dow 30,000 on news that we would probably not have a civil war, bulls danced in the streets and bears went back into hibernation. Boys and girl, it is my pleasure to bring you the most partisan trades of the election. We're gonna Cupid shuffle this episode right into the Kai Apple Pie frat house and meet our first partisan trader. Too rarely in this series do we recognize the challenges the impoverished American college paupers face. But every once in a while, it's nice to explore the plight of the indebted university students and the creative measures they employ to improve their financial prospects. If the point of college is to learn, there's more than one way to suck down a lesson, and our first trader truly paid his Wall Street Bets tuition money to learn the ropes. Ryan Long 770, aka Student Debt Bets, is a student in Georgia who managed to earn an associate's in business by the ripe old age of 18 by using dual enrollment at a community college. However, he feared beginning his journey to a proper university and the financial burden he would face under less generous financial aid packages in the years ahead. Recognizing that college is better when you're not broke as shit, and with the desire to get some real-world experience in business, the young man made the mistake of turning to Robin Hood to get his foot in the door. And boy did he pick an exciting time to invest. With an election looming, Ryan Long indulged 24-hour news and social media for investing ideas. After several weeks of huffing Sean Hannity freebase and sheepdog propaganda, the aspiring adolescent was convinced the presidential election would drive America to civil war. With his extremely bearish outlook, he probably should have bought a rifle. But instead, Ryan took all the money he had in the world, $2,935, and slammed it down on unspecified triple-leveraged S&P 500 and NASDAQ ETF puts, most likely SPXL and TQQ expiring three days after the election with the expectation that the Bugaloo Boys and Antifa would immediately engage in Mortal Kombat and fracture the entire country. If Newsmax and OAN were to be believed, this trade just couldn't go tits up. But Ryan's big dreams of bloodbath and Armageddon failed to materialize. The election offered no impetus for militias to face off in the streets, and the most polarizing groups in the country simply talked trash outside one time and then went back to exchanging spicy memes on the internet. It was much lazier than anyone could have imagined, and the broader market rallied in response. Of course, holding puts on a triple-leveraged bullish ETF in a bull market is one of the top three things you don't want to do, and as a result, Ryan's account dropped to a perfect zero dollars in value. In his very first YOLO ever in life, Ryan Long 770 treated us to the fabled lose literally all of your money trade, which from a technical standpoint is actually kind of hard to do. It looks like the young man was a little too hype. With an election on Tuesday, did he really expect a communist revolution by Thursday? It took several months before anybody even raided the capital, and on that day, stocks went up. 
but at the rate things are going, stocks would have gone up during a civil war anyway. Welcome to the party, Ryan. Stocks only go up. Good luck with that business resume. Now, let's check out partisan trade number four. As Blue Team's victory began to take shape in the days immediately following the election, all eyes were on former cop Kamala Harris. After years of prosecuting people for Mary Jane possession during her days as a DA, it appears that at some point she learned the scariest thing about ganja is getting caught with it, and she made a 180 on her approach to the devil's lettuce during the second half of her political career. During her debate with Race Bannon and the Fly, Kamala promised to legalize La Mota and expunge the records of those who she once prosecuted. When Donkey Team's victory appeared imminent, there was one thing on everyone's mind. Getting high as a kite until we forget we're on planet Earth. Recognizing the tremendous opportunity this victory meant for the weed industry, a slick trader named MVP Bob took some change out of his pocket on Thursday, November 5th and slapped it down on the most well-known of the pot stocks, Aurora Cannabis, ticker ACB. At the time of purchase on Thursday morning, Aurora Cannabis was trading for about $5, and his peasant class investment of $345 brought him a perfect 69 calls at the $6 strike for $5 each, expiring the following day. With a grand total of $345 in play, MVP Bob had his lotto tickets on the table. Despite being a Canadian company with minimal exposure to the US market, the sheer exuberance over the prospect of legalized reefer sent investors deep into Aurora Cannabis overnight. On Friday the 6th, ACB rallied a full 56%, marking a massive 92% increase from Bobby's buy price the previous day. The huge increase in share price translated into an absolute monster gain for Bob's $6 calls. While he bought each contract for just $5, by Friday afternoon, his calls were worth $546 each. That's a 109 bagger, a legendary gain of about 11,000%. By the time he cashed out, he had turned $345 into $37,674 in less than 12 hours of trading. That's enough for about 15 kilograms of mediocre weed in the Los Angeles market, enough to keep an adult male high for 6.849 years if smoked one gram at a time for 24 hours a day. That alone is an excellent return on investment. Don't forget to smoke up your buddies there, Bobbert. We're moving right on to partisan trade number three. For our next partisan trade, we're going north of the border to meet our friend Pike Eater 47 who despite being a full-blooded Canadian with maple syrup in his veins, knew that trading high-flying U.S. equities across the border is the real secret to trading with intensity. A lower middle-class security guard making $19 an hour and probably getting taxed at like 40%, Pike Eater 47's financial situation was difficult to improve. To make matters worse, he suffered the burden of a frigid live-in girlfriend who took on $40,000 of student debt without finishing her degree, but expected Pike Eater to pay it off. As she sat around unemployed and spending his money, our man worked with great determination to secretly set aside $5,000 in case he ever needed to escape his dire predicament. In late October, that day of reckoning came, and Pike Eater 47 shared his disturbing story. He came home one night after a long day of stopping teenagers from shoplifting Toblerone and bagged milk to find a strange man leaving his home. When he asked his girlfriend about it, he was apparently just a friend and no one to worry about. Pike Eater let it go. But after catching this guy sneaking out of his house two more times that month, the rightfully disturbed boyfriend confronted this stranger. Upon being pressed, the man admitted that he was hired, aka a male escort, getting paid to smash this dude's girlfriend while he was working hard earning the money that she paid him. He was literally paying someone to plow his GF. Absolutely enraged, Pike Eater 47 did what had to be done. On October 30th, he took his $5,000 emergency fund and threw it down on out-of-the-money Palantir calls with the contracts expiring on November 27th. At the time, Palantir was trading for a mere $10, but we all know where the stock went over the next 30 days. Palantir achieved ultimate meme stock energy and furiously burned its way to over $30. On expiration day of Friday the 27th, Pike Eater 4 sold the calls just hours before Citron trashed it cashing out a 1,022% gain of about $55,600, which he promptly used to buy almost 1,800 shares. With a 10-bagger under his belt, Pike Eater 47 determined that he would have enough money to leave his girlfriend if his Palantir shares hit 
But how this is even a valid goal before you leave your cheating girlfriend, I have no idea. Canada is apparently a funky place where you have to pay alimony to your girlfriend if you break up with her after living together. But by Pike Eater's own account, that should only be between $500 and $1,000 over the course of a year, so it's no barrier. Nevertheless, Wall Street Bets had his back, with many of his fellow degenerates pledging to buy shares and send Palantir to the moon. And by all accounts, he needs to ditch this toxic relationship regardless of what some American discount NSA company's stock does. As soon as he learns what a covered call is, Pike Eater is going to ditch this debt-ridden girlfriend and live the high life with VIP tables at the nightclub. From a cuck canuck to, hopefully soon, an absolute chad, Pike Eater 47 is about to be back in the game. Please learn what a covered call is, Pike Eater. We're gonna check out partisan trade number two. We're gonna ramp it up here with a story that's bound to piss off every traditional investor who actually does research before placing an order. Our number two most partisan trader is an impatient fellow from Los Angeles who quit the USPS right after orientation because the process was too slow and now works at a fast-paced restaurant for $10 an hour. Known as F Bag Holder, he is, judging by the name, no stranger to placing aggressive trades. In accordance with his lifelong trend of operating with the speed of Sonic on meth, the big guy dove into the market with both feet on November 10th with dreams of millions. Armed with a mere three grand and Robin Hood gold, there was no time to waste. That afternoon, Homeboy dropped his entire stack into slightly out of the money calls on DIA, also known as the Diamonds, the ETF that tracks the Dow. But the following morning, he realized he was not a millionaire and he paper hands those Diamonds calls within minutes of the market opening for a loss of $500. But unperturbed by a loss of one-sixth of his account, F Bag Holder merely switched jackets to ditch those boring ETFs. Within minutes, he threw his remaining $2,500 into out-of-the-money NEO calls at the $44 strike. Fast forward a couple of hours, and his cash pile tripled into over $7,500. Right away, our man started sniffing the WSB solvent, and there was no turning back. Over the next two weeks, Sonic the Meth Hog bought calls on meme stock after meme stock, going all in each time and never holding a single position for more than two days. His trades are an absolute whirlwind. He first doubled his account again with Palantir to 15,000, flipped Fisker eight times to make 2,500 more, then somehow managed to lose $4,000 on plug, nearly doubled again with Neo to $23,000, halved it with Fisker to 13,000, doubled back up with Palantir to 29 grand, and nearly doubled again with Tesla to 54,000, then burned half of it on GameStop back to 28,000 and bought it up to 30,000 again with NEO. By my calculation, he traded every meme stock in the book a grand total of 55 times between 11th of November and 24th of November with no sign of slowing down. Unsatisfied with his $30,000 portfolio and with his adrenaline pumping at maximum force, the speed demon counted to one and went right back in. On Tuesday the 24th, Square was trading for about $204. Anticipating that rampant demand for material goods and services going into Black Friday would drive shares higher, our man bought 229 calls at the $205 strike, expiring on Black Friday itself for a grand total of 30 Gs. Overnight into Wednesday, Square shot up 5% to $212, and those calls had more than doubled in value to about 73,000. Homeboy quickly closed the trade and then immediately trusted the entire stack to Papa Elon at about 2 p.m. when the stock had begun to drop into the red. Buying 73 grand worth of out-of-the-money Tesla calls, the madman was banking big time on an end-of-the-day turnaround. But the muskrat never fails, and Tesla stock rallied back into market close, carrying F Bag Holder's portfolio with it. Once his account hit that treasured six-figure mark about 90 minutes later, the eth head closed the trade and walked out with a $102,700 portfolio. In 10 trading days, the big shot had placed 96 orders, 67 of which were filled, netting him a grand total of 99,791, or over 3,300% in gains. How or if he slept at night, I have no idea. When asked how he achieved such rapid success, our man's response was precisely what you'd expect. I've never read any books. I'm not even well-versed in options. I only understand the very basics. I put no complex thought into this and just traded on instinct. It was pure luck, and if one of these stocks dropped 5%, I'd be wiped out. 
He is, by all accounts, a Wall Street Bets paragon. And what do we do with Wall Street Bets paragons? We press F at their caskets. Next, we heard from F Bagholder. He spoke to us his Robinhood account's last will and testament. After burning his way to an intraday high of almost a quarter million dollars on some unspecified play, most likely Tesla calls, Icarus's wings began to melt off. In the second half of December, F Bagholder chased his dream of reaching the fabled seven-figure mark by dropping a massive six-figure stack into Palantir calls at the $30 strike, expiring New Year's Eve. And although he had success with Palantir prior, just as Palantir can giveth, Palantir can taketh away. The stock fizzled out into year's end, dragging F's account down by about 200 grand before he sold the trash positions off to the next clown. Just like that, one trade, the vast majority of our prodigy's gains got curb stomped. But still packing a $33,000 account, our man's illusions of grandeur remained intact for one last bum rush toward the crown. In a desperate attempt to stay relevant into 2021, Eth trusted his last stack once again to King Elon on Monday, December 28th, tossing it all into Tesla calls at the $700 strike, again expiring on New Year's Eve. Expecting the Lord of Tendies to bring it all back, Eth was feeling confident, but that confidence snapped within moments of the market open the following day. Tesla took the day off to recharge its batteries, and the downward price movement at open Thanos those $700 calls into an 80% loss. Another 26,000 dusted to ash. Our man was left with nothing more than a shadow of his once beautiful account, now liquefied to a mere 7,000. And what's the point of that? Might as well lose the rest on some trash calls while you watch Tesla go back up to 718 right after you sold. And do you know the best part? This isn't the first time he made a hefty six-figure gain only to lose it all. Oh no, he made six figures off the shitcoin boom in 2017 to 18 only to watch it all get bit-connected. Eth was an experienced veteran at this game. Our hero last spoke to us from the grave, urging those who made gains not to follow him down to the boneyard. Let his sacrifice not be in vain. Next time you make a quarter million in a month, take a 30-day break before gambling again. Keep your head up, my man. Third time's the charm. And now, the moment we've waited for. The most partisan trade of the election. One of our favorite movies at Wall Street Bets is The Wolf of Wall Street, a classic film that inspired 18-year-olds around the country to pursue wealth and cocaine at the cost of literally everything else in life. But among all the phenomenal and highly memeable scenes in that movie, there is one that stands out as providing excellent advice to the novice trader. Recall the scene where Matthew McConaughey and Leonardo DiCaprio shared their frequency of FAP. According to the boss, three or four times a week are rookie numbers. You gotta pump those numbers up. Only by doing so can you achieve the constant state of post-nut clarity necessary to be a successful trader. Our most partisan trader is a man who took that advice way too seriously. I give you Sir Jackalot, whose numbers must mean that he has the clearest mind the market has ever seen. So clear, in fact, that he rejected options altogether and instead favored trading an uncommonly used financial instrument called shares. Shares are like options that never expire and don't suffer from ivy crush or theta decay, making them very powerful investment tools. Jackalot began trading at the market's height in early 2020 with a moderate sum of $40,000 to his 401k. As the stock market turned sour in February and COVID took root, homie stayed cool and bought shares in some largely unknown mask-making company called APT and a testing company called Co-Diagnostics to more than double his account. Then he switched to cash and held until the March 23rd bottom. Post-nut clarity at work. With the world's intricacies unfolding easily for Fapalot, he recognized quickly that Slack would readily increase in value as companies turned to telework and Norwegian cruise lines would sell higher as pent-up demand for cruises meant the company was well positioned to take advantage of the coming economic recovery. He likewise identified that mixed signals on the pandemic meant the healthcare industry and travel industry would move inversely. As news stations hyped up the pandemic, healthcare would rise and cruise lines would fall. As politicians hyped up the recovery, the healthcare industry would drop while cruise lines glide higher. As though he could see the future, our man bought the dips and sold the rallies on both sides, flipping shares in healthcare and leisure stocks several times to quickly bring his account to $905,000 by early June. But even after that win, Jack remembered McConaughey's sage wisdom. You gotta pump those numbers up. 
After a five-month trading pause to play Among Us and Animal Crossing, Jackalot reappeared on Monday, November 16th, halfway through No Nut November, and riding the post-election rally, all in, as usual. With his whole account, our man dropped 900 Gs on Corsair gaming shares, banking on the stock's big PP energy and an oddly enthusiastic customer base to send those shares higher. At the time of purchase, Corsair was going for about 2550 and rapidly picking up momentum. On no discernible news, Corsair gained steam early that week, and by Wednesday, the stock was trading at over 3550 a share. Jackalot woke up to his $1,069,000 account, making it look easy. Being a millionaire is fun, but McConaughey's words echoed. You gotta pump those numbers up. Right after selling his Corsair shares, the big shot went right back in, dumping his whole $1,088,000 account into shares of Peloton at a price of $104.60 on Wednesday the 18th. His DD? New York City schools were shutting down again, so quarantine stocks would heat up fast. Like clockwork, Peloton rode up just $5 that week, but that translated into $50,000 for our high roller. Gotta pump those numbers up. In cash once again, our man looked around for his next big play, and GameStop certainly caught his eye. After the PS5 was released on November 12th, customers started buying them up like preppers on MREs. Around this time, Wall Street Bets was abuzz with the mother of all short squeezes and the opportunity this stock held, and a 90-minute Uber Kicks podcast sealed the deal. Armed now with over $1,100,000, Jackalot fully ate the hype, took his whole balance, and yeeted it into over 88,000 shares of GameStop at about $13 on November 23rd. As a backed-up Momo trader three weeks into No Nut November, there was no better way to distract himself than by throwing over a million dollars at a meme stock. The bet was ballsy, but as though the world spun at his fingertips, GameStop shares notched win after win all week long, dragging a tail of parabolic Hulk dildos behind it, up to a high of $20. On the morning of November 30th, Jack gawked at his $1.75 million account. But it wasn't enough. Gotta pump those numbers up. Breaking from his traditional modus operandi, Homie clinched every share with an iron grip, and with earnings looming after market hours on Tuesday the 8th, Jack was convinced that an upbeat earnings report would really kick the short squeeze to maximum speed settings. That afternoon, CEO Sherman, who gets paid way too much money to run GameStop into the ground, took the mic and announced that the company sold 30% less stuff than the year prior. Traders who were promised a short squeeze were pissed, and they dumped shares left, right, and center. GameStop's price just melted off, and by the end of the week, it settled at about 1330. Jack's record of immeasurable success was shattered. Unfortunately for him, the end of No Nut November coincided with a piss-poor earnings report from GameStop, and Jackalot took a hit back down to one and a quarter million. A full half million was gone. But Jack's willpower was maximum. He held his shares with iron chains and rode the stock back up to 15 and a half, where he closed out for a gain of about $216,000 on December 18th. Chugging a super potion to get his HP back in tip-top shape, Jack did some dank DD and found a SPAC prepared for liftoff. Northern Star Acquisition Corp, ticker STIC, is a SPAC. As such, it does precisely jack shit except raise money so that it can buy another business. That might sound like a con to pull money from dumb investors, but as far as we can tell, it's a 21st century non-hostile takeover of a willing business. And what business does Stick intend to purchase? Bark, a company that sells subscription gift boxes. For dogs. As unemployment benefits dry up and our stimulus checks fluttered in valued less than a share of Tesla, other people of means are buying luxury gift boxes for their pets, to the expected tune of $369 million in annual revenue. What better company, Jack reasoned, than to buy Stick, which will acquire Bark, a company that uses Instagram social media influencers to get people to buy Lickies and Chewies for their quarantine dogs. He went all in on December 23rd, picking up shares at about $14.25 each. Stick hadn't done much prior to Jackalot's endorsement, but fortunately for him, CEO Matt Meeker did a spiel on MSNBC that afternoon, and Stick began to rise. Shortly after Jack posted his DD to Wall Street Bets, the stock flew up 20% pretty much immediately the next morning. 
Jackie Boy cashed out his $1.669 million account and posted once more to Wall Street Bets to let others relish in his victory. People piled on to accuse Jack of pumping and dumping. And while we certainly know he does plenty of pumping, we don't know much about his dumping. Jack appears to be sitting pretty, almost certainly enjoying some personal time with his meat while the masses hurl criticism. And just to be a real jerk, as I was making this video, Sir Jackalot posted his $2 million account after he had a smidge of extra gain with Corsair. Will this amazing journey of wealth be enough? We already know the answer. No way. You gotta pump those numbers up. No matter how this thing goes, we congratulate the millionaire for making it this far. And whether he hits eight figures or loses it all, Sir Jackalot is truly a Wall Street Bets hero. Wants to be king. Hey, if you guys enjoyed this video, there's a lot more where this came from. Check out our Dank Trades playlist and catch them all. See you guys next time.